Hey, um, thanks, Simeon. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, folks. Um, yeah, so so this is the update and lifecycle management work stream um, description and status check, I, I guess. And uh, a really important part of this is it's Mojulu uh, collaborating with uh, BizHub, who briefly introduced at the last convening. Uh, we're going to do a lot better job of uh, this evening. So um, agenda, just quickly uh, talk about that collaboration, talk about the problem statement that this work stream, the, the lifecycle management upgrade initially is trying to solve, um, talk about the project, how we're under, how we're undertaking that. And then to the Kafka point, we're going to talk about Kubernetes op operators and and that's how we're going to initially um, start your video later. Yeah, um, and that's how we are going to uh, uh, automate and control the Kubernetes uh, de deployments. Anyway, we, and we and Will is going to give you a demo of the work that he's been doing on that, and then talk a little bit about next steps. So I'm going to ask Brody just to to um, uh, introduce himself and Bizhub and uh, Will, and talk a little bit about them. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everybody. No matter, um, I'm sure you're in hopefully one of those categories, and it's not in the middle of the night somewhere. Uh, I'm Brody James. I work for a uh, along with Will work for a small software development business in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, we're a business of about ten people operating since 2006. Uh, and we build custom bespoke software for organisations who uh, can't take software off the shelf and get the result that they would like. Uh, we often build sort of very small systems, but we also build very large uh, enterprise specialist uh, systems, which are, you know, very important to large organisations. Um, and we do it on a platform which um, started its life in 2006 and has been evolved and refined ever since uh, that date and still fundamental to how we actually deliver outcomes for our customers. Um, it's a technology and a methodology that allows us to operate at relatively low costs um, and be very fast in most cases and very agile and how we go about uh, getting a really good outcome for the customer. And we often take the customer on the journey with us and they participate as we iterate uh, and, and configure and build their functionality until we get to a point where they're satisfied and we've met the requirements. Um, we, because we focus on building custom bespoke software, we have predominantly focused on uh government, defence, um, smaller commercial organisations and NGOs or not-for-profits. Uh, people call them different names. Uh, and we often um, work with parts of those organisations which have compelling need for good quality, uh, important software, but don't have massive budgets. And because we deliver very efficiently and on a relatively low cost, um, we often get to the opportunity to solve some very complex problems. Um, at the core of our organisation, whilst we are a for-profit organisation, it was founded on the principle of um, back in 2006 of doing really interesting work, uh, continually doing research and uh, development and contrib continually tr contributing back to the the broader community. And uh, we actually have community as one of our strategic goals. And I won't bore everybody on what our strategic goals are as an organisation, but um, giving back to the broader community in, in some way through technology is part of um, what uh, was um, sort of one of the foundational principle and it exists today in our strategic goals. And that's really the key link between um, the opportunity to contribute to Mojo Loop uh, community and our goal is that we have an interest in being able to deploy application stacks in modern uh, frameworks and architectures 
um, in varying cloud environments. Um, and so this opportunity not only produces an output for Moduli, hopefully, uh, or you know, a small output, but also gives us an opportunity to improve our skill set. Um, and which ticks off our sort of research and development and community goals as an organisation. Uh, we build and open source our platform under the, the branding of Skive, which uh, if anybody's interested in ha at having a look, um, go to skive.org. You can actually deploy your own application in our uh, our free cloud and run it for an hour or two at a time and start it up whenever you like. Um, it is a low-code and no-code platform, but it is a, a, a platform for professional developers. You can achieve a certain amount as a citizen or business developer, but it is really a platform for, for professional developers. Um, it is proven and battled hard, and we are running some very large systems on this platform, and they have been running for um, many years, and they are doing some very important ta tasks uh, including collecting uh, significant um, sums of money for government organisations. One of our customers collects about half a billion dollars Aussie per year using our platform through various taxes, et cetera. Um, and, and like uh, all organisations, we need to be able to deploy uh, into a number of different environments. So we routinely deploy for our customers on-premise in their environments into their cloud tenancy and into our own cloud tenancy. So we're quite flexible in that arrangement. And obviously, we're always looking to improve uh, that aspect of our business model. And that's uh, what Mojo sort of presents itself as an opportunity for us to further improve how we actually deploy our your application, um, but also to employ um, to improve how we manage our own application stack. And that's really the link. Um, we, because we uh, build relatively low cost applications in many instances, they have a number of different UIs. Here's some examples of them. They have a couple of different UIs that we can use and you can uh, switch as a user from one to the other. And they order, you know, they render on a variety of different platforms, including mobile phones, tablets and, and desktops and so forth. Um, so hopefully our contribution will be valued once it's completed um, with uh, by Mojo Loop and will create some real value for your customers uh, in a variety of places around the world. Uh, it also gives our uh, staff, uh, and in this case, Will, an opportunity to do something new and learn some new skills. And we're about to move on and have a look at what Will has been doing in this space. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brody. Thanks uh, a lot. Yeah. So the joint interest, uh, the joint overlap there is um, uh, is actually uh, BizHub is learning and has learned uh, very quickly uh, about Kubernetes and the Kubernetes environment, and um, and they're helping us with our deployment and learning at the same time. I look, this is how we've been collaborating. Uh, just with some Trello cards, it's been pretty. It's been pretty low touch, really. Uh, uh, about six or eight weeks ago, Will, who's going to give you a pretty, uh, a pretty powerful demo tonight, uh, if we if we can if we can convey the um, the uh, the power of it uh, correctly, uh, and um, and Will's come up to speed in really in a couple of months. I think that's the benefit of taking a very popular open uh, platform like Kubernetes, we there's a huge amount of uh, resources for uh, trying it out, for accessing it and for learning about it. Anyway, that's the collaboration side. I, I hope, I, I don't know, maybe Mojo Loop does this in lots of other places. Uh, I guess, you know, BizHub and, and myself have been uh, under Paul Macon's uh, uh, eye, uh, we've been trying to see if we can do something that helps everybody. Anyway, here's the problem. What are we doing? Um, really addressing operations. Uh, with what uh, with what James just pointed out about the need to talk about an enterprise deployment uh, architecture, uh, also, once you've got it deployed, you need to do two things. You need to not regularly redeploy and you need to be able to operate it. But the problem is that we've got a Kubernetes environment where the release cadence is about every three months, 
And we've got a modular uh, environment where our release cadence is, you know, each PI, which is, you know, roughly three or six months, depending on the, the part of the project. So, so if we're going to have an enterprise commercial deployment, we need to assist our, our, our hub operators with reliable, efficient operations, including upgrade, which is the focus of this. So what's the, what's the motivation? To assist hub operators with business continuity, to lower the costs and really TCO is it's all about TCO and we want to lower operational costs. We want to uh, report and research back to the DA. We, we're learning things here. You're about to see the first thing we've learned, which is about operators. Uh, and we want to see if we can collaborate, as Brody said, with, with another outer district uh, enterprise for-profit company. Uh, is there something there that can be generalised? Anyway, um, so what do we want to do? We want to update the Kubernetes control plane, the Kubernetes data plane, the module loop application, um, and everything that uh, the module loop platform or environment relies on, such as MongoDB, uh, Kafka, uh, Redis, um, Elasticsearch, whatever it is. And one of the things that we <laughs> discovered early on was that there's actually a standard Kubernetes way to take control of all of that, and it's Kubernetes operators. And it's worth just uh, looking at the um, uh, at the definition of from the Kubernetes website. An operator is a concept that lets you extend the cluster's behavior without modifying Kubernetes itself, but actually by 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 linking controllers to one or two custom resources, i.e. to Kubernetes artifacts. So an operator is a client of the Kubernetes API that act as controllers for a custom resource. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? Well, that means that you actually um, deploy a Kubernetes operator and a Kubernetes custom resource definition and any other, other artifacts to actually deploy that are to support that operator. And then you use the custom resource definition to actually make uh, allow the operator to go and configure via the Kubernetes API your Kubernetes cluster. So, for instance, James, Kafka, we actually supply what we should do is actually supply a custom resource definition for the Kafka um, uh, for the Kafka operator. That Kafka operator then will go and lay out the cluster within Kubernetes in the enterprise mode to which you actually define it. I'm, I'm hoping this is a bit of it makes a bit of sense. Um, and there are so a couple of resources on Kubernetes operators. Uh, one is the the top link I've got under uh, under the uh, heading there from the K Kubernetes website. Uh, the other one is the uh, cloud native. Uh, what is it? The cloud native. So, the, anyway, it's the cloud native foundation. Can't, can't remember what the um, what the acronym sounds for. Uh, and the other one is just ask Pedro because he's the guy that was really saying we should be using operators, and I think he's entirely correct. So. You can use an operator to automate, again, this is from the Kubernetes manual, uh, deploying an application on demand, uh, laying out the architecture of that, uh, of that uh, application, uh, taking backups and restores of the application state. And here's the one that we care about for this work stream right now, is handling upgrades of the application code alongside with the related changes such as schema changes or extra configuration settings. Sounds like just what the doctor ordered for databases and for stateful applications. Um, and there's other things as well. Um, worth noting, this is not new. And maybe a number of folks on the call already know about operators and maybe we've got other experts. Um, but uh, uh, very much looking to apply those. And that's what Will has been working on. So 
Uh, you basically deploy the operator. This is all available from Mongo, MongoDB, Kafka, Elasticsearch, MySQL. All these guys uh, provide operators and associated artifacts for using in, uh, the operators. They're all available. And um, and know that what this project is doing, right, is really important, is that it can be difficult to create an operator, which is why I'm laboring the fact of how many are already out there supplied by the vendors. Uh, there's a learning curve. But that actually what is what Will is doing. Um, he's actually hiding the complexity, automating it away, and learning and picking up the skills so we can apply and create an operator for vNext, uh, for Mojaloop uh, vNext, which seems to be the obvious target. So there's a, uh, there's a whole lot that the operator takes care of once you've actually put the operator, once you've deployed the operator and configured it, uh, it will actually ensure that Kafka um, architecture, as I said, James, uh, but it will also do what Will's just about to show us. It will actually take control of the complete update, say, of Mongo database. And uh, that... I'm just going to try and just set the scene by saying um, that Will has already got in the demo that we're that Will's about to show you. He's already got the operator installed and those artifacts installed, and he's about to show you how to um, use that operator to control the upgrade of MongoDB. And I will stop sharing and throw up over to you, Will. Thanks, Tom. I'll just share my screen. So yeah, as Tom said, um, I've already run through the uh, installation process for a MongoDB operator in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I just brought that up here to show what is running at the moment. Um, so for my pods, we can see that we have a Mongo Kubernetes operator itself running and two uh, members of a replica set um, for the actual MongoDB instance itself. We can take a look at that instance and we can see that it is running this version 4.4.0. Well, since this here, I can just also connect that um, MongoDB instance through the command line. Um, so here I just connected to the database and we can see that it is running 4.4.0. So really with the operator itself installed, it's uh, very simple to upgrade the versions of uh, the instances that have been uh, defined by the custom resource. Um, it's really just a matter of up, uh, deploying a new configuration for the deployment that you've already installed. So I'll just do that here um, while I'm speaking because it can take a few minutes to go through the whole entire upgrade process um, for this staple set because it is required to um, provision some of the uh, persistent volumes that a database needs. Um, so I've just kicked off the uh, upgrade, and we can if I take a look at the uh, MongoDB instance again, we can see now it's pending. So this is now in the process of updating. Um, I want to again connect to this. We can see that. All right. And I'm still able to connect to the database itself while this upgrade process is going uh, because the operator allows for a on delete update so that um, the pods can be taken down without uh, loss of, av of availability. 
So while that's still running, I'll just show you some of the uh, configuration files that we need to install the operator itself. So as Tom mentioned, you need to install a custom resource definition. So this is uh, that here. It's quite long, um, so I won't go through all of it, but it basically just details the custom Kubernetes object um, and describes the services that the operator is controlling. The next part is the deployment of the Mongo operator itself. Um, the main features in this uh, configuration is that we can define the uh, versions of the operator and some of the tools that it requires, so such as the agent and the upgrade hooks that um, you, it uses to watch the processes um, over the custom resource. And we can also uh, define the location for the um, MongoDB instance image where that is pulled from. If we need to set that to be a custom location. So to go along with this, we then need to have the actual installation of the MongoDB instance. Um, so this is the configuration of the replica set here. You can see the main feature of this is that we have the version number set here. Um, the number of members in the replica set, if you recall in the uh, pods description, there was two, two members set. That's from this description here and just the users and authentication that the uh, database will require. So the process of updating itself is essentially just to reconfigure this replica set and change the uh, version number here. And then the operator, after applying this new configuration, the operator will take over and apply all the necessary validation and update of configurations to redeploy the new version of the operator. Oh, sorry, the Mongo instance. So just, just, check. So just to make that really specific, once you've got everything installed, Will, all you really did was change that one number and do a kube CTL uh, minus F apply. Yes. Yep. So if you, you notice that these two are virtually identical, just the version numbers changed. Um, and then I previously just applied that here with that command there. So this uh, update's still loading. We think that's going to finish in just a just a minute, Will, because I, what I can do, we can flip back to the slides and then we can yep. just come back and show, I can just pick, yep. show people the next steps and then come back and, um, and yeah, uh, um, yep, there we go. So, so again, so we'll show you under the covers of what you need to and do install the community operator. But that's the sort of thing that like with Miniloop or the other automation projects, that's what Will is 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 working on automating away that complexity for any Mojo Loop user. All they need to do is to change one number and we can possibly even make that so simple as to be a um, an interactive or a, a single configuration file that gets processed into the resource descriptors. Um, so I made the point, and I think it's an important one, that uh, what back in the start of April, Will, you hadn't really seen Kubernetes too much before? Yes, this is my first uh, experience using it. Yeah. So so in, in, a, in, a, in just a few months, uh, Will's gone to now being able to do some, he's very, very familiar with Kubernetes, and he's He's really able and now contributing in a in a significant way, I would argue, to to the Major Loop project. And I think there's some. I think that's actually a pretty powerful uh, model. Um, so he's already working on the CI/CD pipeline to uh, to to hide all that uh, that detail. And then here are the steps: rinse and repeat the exercise from Mongo with Kafka, um, and probably with uh, Redis. And, and then uh, add the Kubernetes control plane 
uh, updates to the CI/CD. If we're running in cloud or you're running in OpenStack, um, then that basically is just really an API call to the to the cloud vendor or a Terraform call. And um, and then here's really where the rubber meets the ah, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, here's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, create an operator. So you saw the Mongo, the MongoDB community operator that will it installed. Let's do the same thing for uh, B, or let's explore doing the same thing for VNext Alpha or, or B, uh, Alpha and Beta. And what our plan is is to demo this in in October in some form, and to then create a toolkit with scripts, etc., so that you can move the um, uh, VNext application. The database and its um, uh, sorry, the Mojo Loop V next uh, version, the database and its um, uh, and its data um, and everything from one release to another, with uh, pretty much zero downtime, and we think that should be somewhat useful for operators. I'll just stop the share. Will are we done? Can you show the? Yep, uh, it's completed. So to show that we've got nothing under the up the sleeve. Can you see my screen again? Yep. Oh, uh, yep. So here are the pods and services again. Um, they've come back up. I can show that the instance itself is now running on this 4.4.22 version um, that we that I defined in the updated configuration. And if I go ahead, I can uh, connect back to that. And we can see now the database has been updated to that version as well. So yeah, it was all just a matter of really updating that one number and then Applying that and letting the operator itself take the take hand take the care of rest of the updates. Really, and that's it. Thank you very much, Will. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Brody. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, all. Hey, Tom. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of questions. I know Michael has his hand raised, and James has a question as well. So. Uh, Michael, are you able to come off mute and ask? I think I am. Thank you, Simeon. Um, I just want to go back, uh, Tom, if that's okay, to a phrase that I think you have, I heard you use, uh, which was pretty much zero downtime. Uh, and I'm interested in the what's in the pretty much or the, what's in the bit that isn't in the pretty much, i.e. what would require downtime. Uh, I think it's when it actually switches. So what Will was showing you is the fact that you could still actually access um, Mongo while the upgrades were happening. But at some stage, it actually has to switch the pods and it has to switch the volumes. So that's why I was trying to be a little bit careful. And Will and I are very much in learning mode here. Um, we're trying to figure out what each of the operators does. So I was being careful to say almost not not zero, because even even when you're doing node upgrades and stuff like that, you still have a switching cost from from one to another. But 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 Kubernetes is built around the concept of of almost zero downtime for upgrades and for lifecycle management. This is just taking advantage of it. Okay, does cool. that answer the question? I think it does. If I'm hedging a little, uh, it's because I'm... I think I would, yes. No, no, I've just seen uh, Pedro's comment, which is really what I would expect to happen. Yes, but but it's, there's still a switch, a point. At, I, I think if you had a heavily well, loaded a system at a, at a point where you could pick a point in time where you might get a, a non-deterministic... Um, you might you have might have to hit reload, right? Uh, oh good. 
I'm, I'm trying to be cautious and not overpromise. No, no, I, I understand completely. Uh, but, I mean, no downtime upgrades are pretty much a uh, holy grail for us, I think. Yes. Um, because, you know, as we all uh, expect with complete confidence, that there will be uh, motion systems running hot in the real world uh, and not able to afford downtime. Um, yes. We are, so, so let's do this, Michael. Let me take that as a question on notice, and Will and I will get back to you about the uh, – because I'm giving you an imprecise answer because I don't know the precise answer right at the moment. I'll be waiting by my inbox. Um, Thank you very much, Tom. No worries. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, I, I think these operators have a, a lot of potential to simplify um, – our maintenance process when it comes to upgrading image versions um, for uh, for cluster-like deployments where we've got multiple instances of a particular service running. Um, I, I wonder what the limitations are when it comes to things like um, stateful services. Um, something like Mongo is quite seamless, right? But you, you mentioned that there was a, a flip over in volumes as well. So. Um, Presumably, there has to be compatibility between the data that's on a disk somewhere or on a volume somewhere and the new version of the image that's reading that. If, if let's say, you, you were wanting to upgrade through a breaking change of a DBMS, I know they're, they're few and far between, but if you had data on a disk that wasn't compatible with the new version of an image, would, would you expect the operator to handle that migration for you? Or is that something so, you would have to manage yourself? What the, what the manual says uh, is handling upgrades of application code alongside with the related changes, such as database schemas or, or extra configuration settings. And what we're really doing tonight is presenting to you the research that we're doing and the direction we're heading. And I've noticed Miguel's got some pretty useful comments in the chat. Um, so... Again, I, I, I don't want to give guarantees about something that we haven't proven yet or haven't really researched to the to the nth degree. So this is sort of, but but what I would expect to be able to do is to give you all those examples, well, depending on, 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 on a few factors, but, but my, my hope would be to give you those uh, answers between now and October. Yeah, understood. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I, I do see a lot of potential for simplifying our Helm chart, at least, um, yeah, because a lot of the complexity, you know, of managing those deploying of, of clusters of services and what have you, if, if that's taken care of by an operator, wow, we have less code to worry about, less code to maintain. That's good. Thanks. Uh, uh, yes. Um, awesome. Any last questions um, for Tom? Uh, Tom, I see a lot of comments in the chat, so I'm hoping we'll jump on those at some point. Uh, yep. So next, what's the next steps? What are you thinking about in the next PR? Did you hear that, Tom? Uh, well, oh. actually, I put that in the, in the steps. Um, the plan is to create an uh, to look at Kafka, which which um, which. Uh, Miguel says it's actually more difficult, but I notice there's been some recent releases with Kafka too. Um, and uh, look at Redis, sort of sort of rinse and repeat what we're doing here, and then actually apply that. And this is the major work. Can we apply that pattern to uh, uh, basically using the vNext Alpha that uh, that Pedro is going to talk uh, talk to us uh, uh, about um, tomorrow? I think. So, so that's the major work is is actually creating our own operator. Um, it, it looks like it looks like the Kubernetes approved way to go. It looks like very well supported by the industry. Um, let's see where it heads. I, I don't think you should be making product plans around it today, uh, but I I think as we progress with Vnext, we'll. We'll do more and more of the investigation and come back to you. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you.
Thanks so much, Tom. Um, Tom, uh, you still need to cover the mini loop and alternative multi cloud native deployment tool. Do you want to proceed with those? Or uh, yeah, I'm most happy to. And um, uh, again, just let me thank uh, uh, Bizhub and Brady and uh, and Will because. Um, guys, this, they're, they're really giving us something for nothing. But the but the wonderful thing is they're getting something back. I, I think this is, I think this is a great. I hate the word synergy. So I just really want to express our uh, our appreciation for their efforts.